Among the First Nations peoples of this continent, there are certain individuals who are given sacred objects for the transmission of a deep spiritual message and objects from one generation to the, to the next. The peace pipe of the white buffalo calf woman is one such object. The custodians of these objects see their role as a sacred trust not only to the tribe, but to all creation and the great spirit. Their whole lives are lived in relationship to this sacred trust. So a question we have this morning before us, do we regard our faith as a sacred trust? If we do, how do we live it? We listened this morning to a familiar parable of Jesus that might answer that question. Good morning. Please stand if you are able for the gospel reading. The gospel this morning is Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But the ma his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I do not scatter? then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the 10 talents. For to those who have more, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Glory to God in the name of Jesus Christ. In baptism, each of us is made a child of God, bearer of sacred promises made by God in Christ Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit to guide us to bear those sacred promises. The Spirit guides us to confess our faith and then to grow in holiness so that we bear the light of Christ into the world, those around us. 
There is a sacred deposit of Holy Spirit within us through which Christ is revealed in our lives. Take a moment and consider how Christ has made you a special gift of his love and divine presence. Indeed, many religions recognize that there is some divine presence that comes to those who follow that faith, that religion. It is treated as sacred. Do we, as Christians, hold it sacred? How often we do not want, it seems, to treat it as sacred. We feel broken and miserable, just overworked and tired. But this gift is nevertheless present in us. It is still there. It's in our hearts ready to burst forth in life and light. Do you know this about yourself? Do you know that this seed of God is present in you. All too often we leave the gift unwrapped and tucked away like a love letter we're afraid to read because, of course, we're afraid we might be getting dinged. Maybe that's an old word from my college days, but you know what I mean. There's always the danger that the lover will send you the letter that says, whoops, it's over. So we don't even read the wonderful letter of love. It would be better, you know, if we treated this gift like a bag of flower bulbs, something to plant in cold, hard earth in the, this time of year, in the dying days of autumn, in the hope that spring will bring them to life and beauty. But it is cold and nasty out. We're not that interested in standing around in the cold rain trying to break through hard earth sometimes. The gospel message today is an invitation to ac access the gift that God has given you. When you don't access it, it will feel as though we are thrown to the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Most of us know that place. It's a sense of hopelessness, of disconnection, of isolation, of estrangement. It's being kicked out of the Garden of Eden all over again. It's a sense that we're just not complete. And we're not connected. But the gospel... The gospel is that invitation that we receive to take up the sacred gift and trust which has been given to us, which makes us ambassadors of God, priests of Christ. Yes, priests. What is an ambassador? Usually the ambassador rent represents a principal, a king, or a country, or some other superior. And the role of the ambassador is to bring forward the interests of the principal in the world, where there are competing interests. And St. Paul has said we are Christ's ambassadors. So how is it that we forward the interests of Christ with our lives? Do we invest the spiritual gift of faith to bear fruit, to bring home a harvest of life devoted to the way of Jesus? Or do we just follow our religion out of fear that we will be punished for failure to do so? Are we just lukewarm Christians? In the parable, as Jesus told, tells it, there is one slave who just tucks the, the money in the ground, which was perfectly legal as a, a means of keeping the trust of a superior. You could bury that money in the ground and you were deemed to have done the right thing. But the master says, 
You could have at least given it to the bankers. They would have gotten you interest on this money. There was nothing to show for this. Now, I'm not thinking that Jesus wants us to be raging, greedy capitalists. But I do think that his goal here is to see if we take the gift that God has given to us and we invest it in our lives so that there is something new to show for it in the world. How are we doing? St. Peter says that we are all priests of Jesus Christ. It means we're all to be mediators of the love of Christ in the world. That it is our calling as Christians to live so that Christ is revealed in the world around us. How are we doing? How are we mediating Christ to the world around us? Now, I don't think that means running around and bonking people who disagree with us and criticizing people who are different and taking down people who have different ways of living or different culture from our own. It simply means, are we taking that sacred trust of God's love and sharing it so that somebody else knows that they're valued that they have worth, that they are not insignificant, that it doesn't matter what kind of mess they've gotten into, they're still valuable to God. How are we doing in that work? I think we'd like to bear Christ into the world, to see our lives bear fruit, to show the giftedness that God has bestowed upon us. But you know, we get confused and afraid and worried about all sorts of things and just plain tired out. But this parable invites us to take the risk of investing in the reality of God here and now. You know, we sing that wonderful, some glad day as though our faith is almost entirely about what happens when we die. It's a, I love it, but, it's, but it is not just about what happens when we die. It's not about a pie in the sky, right? Yes, there are good things which come to those who live in faith at the end of this life. But we are called to live today into the reality that God has brought to us to live in us and through us in the world. What is it? Hmm. We have to take risks. Now, a lot of us don't want to take risks. We don't want to take risks with our money. We don't want to take risks in our lives. We don't want to take risks in our work. We don't want to take risks with our acquaintances and the people we hang out with. We are risk averse. If Jesus had been risk averse, I don't think we'd know about him. If Paul had been risk averse, I don't think we would read his letters. If St. Francis had been risk averse, I don't think we would honor his memory. If John Wesley had been risk averse, there would be no Methodists at all. Just take Wesley. He was the child of a a parish Anglican priest in England. He went to the university. He did well. He was ordained. He could simply go and get a nice little parish somewhere and preach and collect the, collect the offering and go through the rituals of the church. <coughs> but he didn't do that, did he? <coughs> Instead of just taking the easy course he said, no, there's something serious about this business of being a Christian. It should actually transform our lives so that we live differently. We should be people who study the scriptures. We should be people who actually engage in prayer and seek to be in contact with the divine. We should be people who share our resources with others. We should be people who visit the sick, the imprisoned. We should be people who give education to those who cannot afford it and clothes to those who do not have it. 
And when he died, what did he have left over? He gave what money was in the house to the poor through the stewards of his movement. And he died. He was not rich. He had nothing left to give. But he had given his entire life to the service of God in the world, that people would experience God through his life. And he could be a pain in the neck, okay? John Wesley was not a perfect human being, and he could be irritating. He used to ask his wife. But the truth is that he touched ultimately millions of human lives. Poor people, mostly. People who had no hope. People who had no expectation that God cared about them. Because when they went into a church, they had to sit and stand in the back while the rich people sat down up front on the cushion seats. He went to those poor people and he preached to them where they worked, where they lived. He preached to them the love of God that it, it matters and it comes to each and every person. It doesn't matter who your father was. It doesn't matter what your accent is. It's what Jesus asks us to do today. To live into this risk taking for the gospel. The very future of local churches hinges on our willingness to take the risks of faith. To listen to the call of the Holy Spirit. To listen to God. To trust in the love of God. We're called to lean into that faith and move forward. What would that look like for you personally? Because friends, it doesn't look the same to every person in this room. God's call to each one of us is a little different. Some of you might be called to go on a mission to Puerto Rico next spring. Some of you might be called, for heaven's sake, to commit to come to church every Sunday that you are physically able. For others, it would be tithing 10% of your income for a season or a year. For another, it might be <clears throat> visiting hospitals regularly, visiting nursing homes, visiting those who are, in, who are homebound. It might be coming and serving meals here. It might be reaching out to kids who need a mentor. How are we each choosing to live out this call? When everyone in a church makes a commitment to take the risk to step out of the comfort zone that we have and to move into the world with the love that God has entrusted to us, then God's supernatural power can work in us and through us. Some of you might be old enough to remember a movie called Babette's Feast. Does anyone remember that movie? All right. Babette was a French woman who had to escape a revolution in Paris, and she goes to a Scandinavian island. And I just ask forgiveness of you Scandahoovians here tonight, today. But anyway, these people were really tight. And she was told to cook for this elderly couple of sisters, and mostly it was dried salted fish and bread. I mean, it was boring. And... <clears throat> Eventually, somebody in Paris had invested in a lottery and she, for her, and she wins the lottery. And instead of taking all this money and going off and spending it on herself, she says, these people took me in when I had nothing. I'm going to prepare for them the finest feast that they have ever had because in her previous life, she had been a world-famous chef. And she prepares this grand meal with course after course of delicacies and wonderful food. And of course, <clears throat> the uptight people on this Scandinavian island decide that this is sinful. You're not supposed to enjoy life, right? So they refuse to enjoy this meal. And finally, this one outsider says to them, what is wrong with you people? This woman is a world-famous chef. She is giving you thousands of francs worth of banquet because she loves you and is appreciative of all that you've done. And so reluctantly, they decided to enjoy the meal. So often, 
the God, what the gospel offers us is a feast. It is a feast of God's love that comes to us as in profound and deep and different ways. And if we are willing to receive it, we take the risk of receiving more by giving it away. I don't know about you grandparents out here, but I bet that it's more important at Christmas when you give a gift to a grandchild and the child is delighted than it is anything that your children give you. I know your children love you and they really try to give you something nice, but you know how many neckties do you need, right? You joy in what you give away because somebody's life is touched by it, right? Ultimately, this is what God invites us to do, is to give our lives away. We talk about soldiers and sailors and other military people giving their lives away for us. And, and we honor that, but as Christians, we're invited to give our lives away to other people. How are we doing? How are we doing giving away the love that God gives to us. <clears throat> what are you doing with your life to give the love that God has for you to somebody else? Somebody in your family, somebody in your neighborhood, somebody that is across the world, somebody that's across the tracks, somebody who looks different from you or speaks differently from you. Hmm? What are you doing? Because you know what? All the love that we hold on to when we kick the bucket, as my grandfather said shortly before he did, it doesn't do you any good. It's all just gone. But if you can die having given away as much love as God has poured out for you, the world is a better place. God's kingdom has taken shape around you. There is a place of light where, God, where people say there's something happening there. There's a place where God is being revealed in the midst of human suffering. That's our task. It is a glorious and wonderful task. It doesn't make us look better than anybody else. It makes God look good. Because God is good. God is love. And the more we give of God's love to others, the more God is revealed. So let's take up the banquet that's prepared before us. Let's step out of our comfort zones. Let us go forth and share the abundant grace and love of God. So this year, we're getting to the end of the Christmas, Christian year, you know, in a few weeks. Advent is the first Sunday of December this year. It's not next week. Amazing, amazing. That happens every, I don't know how often. So we begin a new Christian year as we await the birth of Jesus and move through the calendar what are we doing for the coming year? What is it that you will do in the coming year to share the love of God? I can't sit here and tell you what you have to do. We're Methodists. You wouldn't pay any attention to me anyway. Right? <laughs> what I'm here to do is to say... This is an invitation. It's good for you. You remember when your parents said that to you? and said, no, it may be good for me, but it doesn't feel that way. And often that's true when it comes to what God has invited us to do as Christians. It may not feel good right away. Tough. <laughs> the more we give, though, the more we recognize that God is working through it. The more our life has meaning and purpose, the more there is grace touching people around us, the more we can joy in what's happening in the lives of others. So friends, as you come to the new Christian year, think about it. What am I giving? And when you go to the Thanksgiving table, 
and you overeat. I know none of you would do that, but I will. When you go to the Thanksgiving table and you're thankful, be thankful that God's love for you is so profound that you have so much to give that you can give it to the next person, even Uncle Harry who drives you nuts, right? And the next person. And the next person. And may you be blessed again and again. Amen.